Back to the second petition, which is PE 1496 by Alan Wiley. I think Mr. Wiley's in the building. And I'll, um, so this is on behalf of No to Bedroom Tax campaign on bedroom tax mitigation. Um, members have a note by the clerk. That, members have a note by the clerk. The spice briefing and the uh, petition. Um, Jackie, M Jackie Bailey, MSP, has expressed an interest in the petition, but I'm not sure she's able to attend today. But um, could I welcome Mr. Wiley to uh, the committee today? I uh, understand you for some transport problems, Mr. Wiley, but uh, yes, I'm, glad yes. you're, I'm glad you're here. Um, uh, if I could ask you to make a short presentation of a maximum of five minutes, and then we'll move to questions. I'll kick off with a couple and then ask my colleagues uh, to take place. So, Mr. Wiley. Uh, I probably should introduce myself. My name's Alan Wiley, and I represent No to Bed and Tax campaign. We're a uh, a modern organic campaign which incorporates online stuff and traditional political activism. Uh, we've got three main objectives that can be split up into two groups, political and civic. We, we help and support people who are affected by the bedding tax and other welfare reforms. Because we are online, we can, we can come directly towards us and we can be a hub and we can direct them to the, the experts who can help them. Uh, our political aims are to mitigate the bedroom tax and to ultimately end the bedroom tax. And that's why I'm here today, to mitigate the bedroom tax. At present, there's £35 million in the system to mitigate the bedroom tax in Scotland, but the shortfall was £53 million. This shortfall has led to inconsistencies between local authorities when dealing with discretionary, discretionary housing payments which is resulting in some of the most vulnerable tenants being left without any support. Shelter Scotland says that the money in the system will help seven out of ten Sc Scottish tenants. I'm, on, I'm here on behalf of the three that aren't getting any support from the councils or from any other sources. This money would cover the, the tenants' rent, the extra rent for the bedroom tax. It would result in tenants being protected, every tenant in Scotland being protected from the bedroom tax. It would also protect housing, housing associations and uh, local authority budgets. Uh, for example, uh, Renfrewshire estimates will lose £1.8 million from lost revenue from the bedroom tax. This can be solved with this, this petition. When the bedroom tax came in in April, uh, there was a big national uproar and a lot of people didn't know what to do. There's been a lot of uh, scared people out there. And even now, when you're in the streets, you're asked, they're asking you for help, and you say, have you, have you applied for DHP? And they I don't know, what's, what's that? This can be seen in Edinburgh, where 50% of those affected by a bedding tax haven't applied for any help. This shows that this, this, this tenants are scared, and because they're scared, they're not interacting with their with the landlords, and that can have problems down the line. When I speak to people, uh, the fear is, is evictions, but it's more debt. It's, it's the debt that this brings. When you, when you have rent arrear debts, it can, you can, they can take you off the housing list. I know that's been, that's been looked at. But a lot of people are just scared that these debts are going to hang over them, and their petition would, would get rid of those debts. Mr. Wiley, for your uh, presentation, I have a couple of uh, questions. Um, do you have any figures for the level of rent arrears attributable to bedroom tax for each of the local authorities in Scotland and social landlords as well? Uh, Cosler done a, a state uh, research, and uh, I'm sure it was it said 20 million was for the local authorities. I, I don't I, I I don't think I've actually got that numbers on me. I, I apologise. That, that's all right. I wasn't expecting you to have a but, chapter and verse for every local authority. If you do have that figures, um, it would be certainly be useful to, to send that into the committee. The, the other question I had was, um, I think it was on your petition that you mentioned, if I understood it correctly, that 79% of affected households have a disabled person within the household. I suppose at one level I could probably would expect that. That's a very high number, and that's going to really adversely affect people who are in many ways very vulnerable in society in Scotland. The burden tax, it does affect, as you say, some of the most vulnerable, and there's support out there, but the support's not enough to help everybody, whereas this petition would, would result in support for every, every tenant. 
But as you say, it does particularly attack the disabled community. I think uh, the citizens' advice does research and it's 80%. 80% are disabled or a disabled person in the household. And we need to, that's why you'd get people that, when you speak to people, it's, it's a lot of people that are saying it doesn't affect me directly, but, I, but I'm against it. Because the people it does affect are, are people who are quite isolated and, and quite vulnerable. And that's, that's one aspect of the bed and tax, which is really vicious and, and bad. I mean, clearly some local authorities, I think you pointed this out in your petition, some local authorities have taken a, a sort of no eviction policy. And that obviously is important, but the, the wider issue, of course, is some mitigation is required as well, because obviously local authorities also have a general duty under Audit Scotland to make sure that rent arrears are reduced. Clearly, this, that was a policy was identified before we, had, before we had bedroom tax. But would you agree some sort of comprehensive policy is required? And it's not just a single tier one. I think that they need to be uniform, uniformity between uh, local houses, uh, local authorities, just dealing with the, the whole the whole shebang. Because as I said earlier, there's, there's, in some of the local authorities, they, they regard DLA as income, income, and others they, they don't. And it means that some disabled people are being barred from getting discretionary housing payments due to them being disabled. So we need a, we do need a uniformity uh, along along the lines and no evictions. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a lawyer. People, people are really scared about getting affected, though. There, there's, a, there's, a, there's a fear. And the final point for us, my colleagues, to come in is um, we had a, a similar um, petition um, earlier this year, and um, we referred this on to the Welfare Reform Committee pool because they were actively looking at this. I mean, generally, the committee isn't uh, a simple referral organisation. You know, as you probably know, we try and do as much as can for each petition. Uh, the exception being where we have another committee having an active work programme. Um, it's obviously a matter for the committee, and it's not at quite at this stage yet, but what, what's your own view about the Welfare Reform Committee looking uh, in more detail at your petition? Yes, yes. I, I, I think there needs to be, some, there needs to be a, a degree of urgency, because we're getting to, to that time of the year when it is, you know, it's getting cold and the energy prices are, are skyrocketing. Food prices are skyrocketing, and the bedroom tax is a, it's a line in the sand. It's a, the straw that's breaking the, the camel's back, so they say. Uh, and people are, are struggling, and, and that's why I think it needs to be some, some urgency to get help pretty much immediately. Thank you very much for that. Thank and I bring my colleagues in. Chip Brody? Yes. Good morning, Mr. Wiley. Hello, Alan. Uh, I've had the pleasure of sharing platforms with Mr. Wiley, um, and very constructive they have been. Uh, for some six, seven months now. Um, and we both share the view of this uh, bedroom tax, under occupancy tax, is iniquitous. And uh, as I said, we committed some time ago that this should be removed and certainly will be removed if we have the power to do so. Um, Mr. Wiley, I think after the last budget, you indicated that you were, uh, to me, that you were thrilled that we got the 20 million, which increased 20 million. I mean, you do know that the Scottish Government have a limitation on what they can actually do because of the reserve powers uh, under welfare reform, which have been applied in this particular case. Uh, I think that when the budget was announced, uh, we live in a time of politics is quite dour and dire, and sometimes it's just outright poisonous. That good acts have to be applauded. You know, you know I think Shelter asked in one week for the, the increase in DHP, and the next week the, the Scottish government the Scottish government done that. And I think at the, the time that that needs to be applauded. That sh that should be applauded. I think I said at the time uh, the Scottish government stepped up to the plate. So to extend that analogy, uh, you stepped up to a plate, but you didn't hit a, a home run in third base. So we help them some, at the pre what, what's been done by the Scottish Government has, has been really, really good. You know, it has been proactive, but it's not help, helping if to. And but there's a limitation because of the reserve powers that the, the, the increment beyond 20.1 million, which, which was afforded in the budget, is not feasible under the existing legislation. I don't. I, I, I think that I, I think if there's a will, there's a way. 
I, I, I appreciate uh, with any form of medication, you can have your, your positives and your, and your negatives. And, and with, uh, with this form, with financial form, there, there's a, a legitimate argument that you're robbing Peter to pay Paul. But I, I don't agree with that argument. I think that it's about priorities. It's what governments do. Governments, they decide how uh, policies, they cost it, they fund it, and then they go with it. Uh, I trust that the Scottish government and this, the, this parliament as a whole will will make the, the right choice if it can be done. Yeah, that's the point. It can be done. Uh, a similar situation uh, last year in terms of uh, being instructed by Westminster to apply pension increase the, the pension fees and the suggestion was that if we didn't do it, then monies would be withheld by the Westminster government, which would then impact uh, what, 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 what uh, we collectively, not just you know, SNP, collectively want to see in Scotland. So there is a penalty for not following, uh, as much as we regret it, uh, for not following the powers that exist in the Scotland Act. I, I just go back. I, I think if there's a, if there's a will, there's a way. If, if it can't be done, then, then I, 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 I truly apologise for wasting your time. I, I, and I but, accept that. But can I just ask, I mean, currently we, we made we, a £33 million Scottish Welfare Fund was, was made available. It had been set up to administer community care grants and crisis grants. What's your understanding of the uptake of that? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not too sure. I, I do know that I, I, I believe it's £233 million the Scottish Government's given to mitigate welfare reforms over the next three years. And that's, a, that's a lot, a lot of money. And it's, it is a bit of a cheek for me coming back asking for more, but I'm, I'm asking for more for the, for the right reasons, because uh, there are people out there that, that need that need help that are not getting that are not getting the help that, that's needed. I would be the last person, as I having shared a platform with you, not understanding your motivation, which is uh, which is highly uh, commendable, and I'm sure we share that. But there are uh, restrictions, and, but we have tried to make funds available. Do you think the local authorities are doing enough to communicate what is available to uh, those that are either suffering rent arrears or uh, not taking up welfare fund? I, I don't think it's... I don't, it's been unfair to, to, to have a blanket opinion on all of them. Some, some, are, some are very good and very proactive. Others are, are, not, that, are not as proactive as others. They, they, they seem that they could, they could do more. They could do more. How do you think we should persuade them to do more? <laughs> Protesting. But you think I, we should persuade them to do more? I, I, I've been emailing uh, uh, councillors, asking them to, 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 to do more. I've uh, been lobbying them. Uh, on some occasions you get some success, and others, and others you don't. It's just just keep trying and keep trying, chipping away and hoping to get something. Thank you. Um, Angus MacDonald. Thank you, <coughs> convener. Good morning, Mr. Wiley. Um, I think it's fair to say that there's very few people in this parliament who don't have a, a great deal of sympathy with, with your petition. Um, however, following on uh, from Chuck Brodie's points, um, I understand it that, uh, uh, your as I understand it, your, your petition is calling on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to do something that it legally can't do. Um, as, you, as you're aware, and as Chick Brodie alluded to, there's a, a legal maximum as to how much the Scottish Government can top up the Scottish discretionary housing payment uh, budget, um, hence the 20 million figure uh, announced by, by John Swinney that, that we have. So the legal maximum, uh, again, as I understand it, is set by statutory instrument uh, made under Section 70 of the Child Support, Pensions and Social Security Act 2000 which was incidentally introduced by the Labour government when Alistair Darling was the working pension secretary. So it's a case of um, we would if we could. Um, have you any suggestions as to how the Scottish government can get round the, 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 the legal constraint? Um, I mean, it's all very well to have priorities, as you mentioned earlier, um, but if, if we have legal constraints on these priorities, um, how, how do we get round it? I mean, and can I just qualify that by saying it is frustrating for everybody? Yeah, yeah, I, I totally appreciate. It. I, I, I was given advice that there might be you could make a, a homeless, a professional homeless fund, or that the monies could be directed to the the social registered landlords as a 
supplement for their income. So there's more, there's more mechanisms to get the money into the system rather than just discretionary housing payments, which I do appreciate that's at the, it's already at the maximum. But it's different mechanisms, at least I, I was advised it's different mechanisms that the money could, could be put into the system. Yeah, and are you aware if Shelter, for example, have fed this into the, the Scottish Government as a suggestion? I, I, I spoke to Shelter, uh, and uh, they are, I spoke to them just previous, uh, just after the, the budget, and they were quite happy about how things were. They and then they were going to say that they were just going to see how things panned out. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm not too sure. I'm, I'm not in that, that deep contact with them. Thank you. Thank you. Anne Thanks, convener, um, and thank you, Mr. Wiley, for your presentation. Um, wholeheartedly, fully agree with with what you're asking for here, and we don't normally um, stray into kind of political territory in a sense. However, for this occasion, I will. Um, I fully um, agree with you that that our present government do have other ways and means, and, and if there is a will, there is a way. Um, you have mentioned some of. I'll describe that for some of my colleagues. Um, local pay local government and the housing associations, like you had mentioned earlier, the funding for to do that. But you're exactly right. Where there is a will, there is a way. Thank you. Uh, I've John expressed Wilson. that. Thank you, convener. Uh, thank you, Mr Wiley, for coming along. And I think other members have already said it in the committee. We have every sympathy with the petition. It's how we deal with the shortfall. And I just want a clarification from yourself in terms of what the shortfall is. Now, my understanding is the Scottish Government have set aside £20 million. Uh, the Department of Work and Pensions have set aside, uh, if I get the figure correctly, £13.47 million. Uh, taking these two figures together, Based on the figure that was calculated previously of a £50 million shortfall, uh, that leaves a gap of £16.3 million. Is that your estimate of the figure that's required? That's number that, yeah. £16.3 million. Can I seek further clarification based on uh, Anne McTaggart's assertion that there are other ways that the Scottish Government can actually get round and have, uh, this, what's currently been put in place by a Westminster government in terms of a bedroom tax. It reminds me of the debate about the tax varying powers that the people of Scotland voted for in 1997 as part of the uh, setting up of this parliament. The, the then UK government indicated to the Scottish people that if the Scottish parliament or the Scottish government decided to, to use those tax varying powers the money would be clawed back. Whether they decided to raise or reduce by three pence in the pound, that money would be clawed back by the UK Treasury. Would you not see, therefore see, that if the Scottish Government did try to bypass the proposals uh, or the, the instituted by the UK Government, that the UK Government could then cut the Scottish Government block allocation which means that expenditure in other areas may be affected uh, by the decision of the UK government, not by the decisions of the Scottish government. I, th I think that goes back to uh, a, a negative or, or a ramification of financial medication. It's, it's. I, I do, I do see your point of view because you've got your Robin Peter to pay Paul basically. But my argument is that governments do that. That's that's what governments do. They they decide a budget and. Uh, they fund the budget, they, and they go for it. I, I, do, I, do, I do take a point, because it is a, legit, a legitimate argument. It's just not one that I agree with on this point. It's fine to use the analogy, the Rob Peter to pay Paul, but in this situation, we're actually talking about paying Paul and the Scottish Government being robbed of a, the, an allocation of resources from the UK Government, because the Scottish Government has actually carried out that uh, or taking forward that decision to give the additional 13.6 million to local authorities or to social landlords to try and bypass a piece of legislation that was introduced by a Westminster government. 
Again, I, I appreciate your point. I, 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 I trust if the, if the Scottish Government did uh, find this money that whatever budget it comes out of, it is, uh, uh, I trust the Scottish Government to be uh, use a common sense approach so it doesn't have negative ramifications. I, I do have the, the trust that the Scottish Government would do that. They, would, they wouldn't take the money out without hurting somebody. Else. Take the money out of another budget that could hurt another sector or another stakeholder. Uh, I could trust in, in politicians that they can make the, the sensible choice and the common sense approach. Sorry. As I said, convener, what we're asking for is mitigation against a, a policy direction that's been uh, carried out by Westminster. And I have no doubt, given the pilot yesterday introduced in Inverness for the universal credit, we'll see other demands possibly being made on the Scottish Government to offset the losses that will be made by many families throughout Scotland once universal credit uh, comes in. And potentially, this could just be the thin edge of the wedge of asking the Scottish Government to actually carry out mitigation measures for policies that are being pursued by a Westminster Government. Thank you. I'm at Taggart. Convener, um, I'm failing to, to get a grasp of the dif difference between the UK Government imposing um, sanctions on the Scottish Government and the Scottish Government imposing sanctions on local authorities, um, of whom by are, are trying to rectify this issue as best as they can. Um, Sorry, carry on. Mr Wiley is exactly right. Where there's a will, there is a way. Can I say, John Wilson? Just, just for clarification, Convener, my understanding is the Scottish Government is not imposing sanctions. The, the, it's the UK Government that's imposed sanctions on those individuals who have what the UK Government determined overcapacity in, the, in bedrooms. The Scottish Government are trying to mitigate against the sanctions being imposed by Westminster. The Scottish Government has not imposed any sanctions they don't on any... any sanctions. They, they, don't, they have not imposed any sanctions in relation to the bedroom tax. Okay, I want to draw Mr Wiley into this point. Um, I did indicate earlier that Jackie Bailey had an interest in this but was unable to uh, attend the, uh, the time. I'm glad we've got now Jackie Bailey with us. I understand Jackie Bailey's got a, a bill, uh, a member's bill, which has, uh, may have an impact in this particular area. Uh, the background very quickly is um, I explained to Mr Wiley earlier that previous petition we'd referred to the Welfare Reform Committee because the convener was very keen that was part of their work cycle. Uh, it would make sense if the committee agree that uh, we do refer this um, petition to that. Normally, we're not just a referral committee, and we obviously want to give everyone um, a, a clear time to put their case, and a number of members have asked quite detailed questions about that. So that's where we're, we're currently at. Would you like to make a brief um, couple of points? Uh, if I Bill? might, Convener, and I apologise to the committee for, for arriving late. Um, I did arrive in time to hear John Wilson's contribution, and I wonder whether I could pick up with Alan some of, some of those points. Um, I'm not sure whether Mr Wiley knows that, that Danny Alexander, who's the Chief Secretary of the Treasury, was before the Parliament, before one of the, the committees, and he was very clear that it was up to the Scottish Government what they did with their money in terms of mitigation and that there would be no clawback. Um, were you aware of that, and does that offer you some comfort that the UK Government won't claw back from the Scottish Government the money? I, I, was, I, I was aware of him saying that. I, I did see that in the, in the press reports, and that gives me some... That gives me some I'm a little, little more relaxed after hearing what he says, but yeah, yeah I did hear him say that, yeah. Okay. Um, the, the other observation I would make is that, um, having spoken to some of our local government colleagues, I know they're very supportive of your petition, and COSLA certainly supported it, um, but I understand the existing money from the Scottish Government, the £20 million, which is very welcome, wasn't ring-fenced. So actually local authorities who have already topped up could use that money for some other purpose. Does that not demonstrate that they actually have the power to provide the money and local government has the power itself to make payments, whether it's through, say, a housing sustainability fund or a homelessness fund or anything of that order? The mechanism is, is, is not really important. It's the money. I, I do believe there are different mechanisms to go through. As you, as you, as you mentioned, I think that maybe... Should the, the low take up of DHP it'd be best for them if, they, if the money did go to social registered landlords and some sort of income supplement for income and that, that would 
that would be just the need for t tenants to contact them. But it's the me there's different mechanisms, I do believe, uh, for, 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 for local authorities to help, yeah. So, finally, convener, in your view, is there anything to stop the Scottish Government from making the £50 million available in terms of mitigation of the bedroom tax, which I think we would all agree is quite a horrendous tax? It's their own choice. It's their own choice. Okay. Thank, thank, thank you, Mr Wiley. Can I bring in Chip Brodie and then John Wilson? Oh, I'll, I'll, I'm trying to forget that very selective rewriting of, of uh, uh, Ms Bailey's understanding of... Uh, the Section 70 of the Child Support, Pensions and Social Security Act. Um, uh, you know, uh, it's always good, I say, Ms Bailey, to come and draw a picture, albeit very late. Um, I wonder, uh, Alan, if, if, Mr Wiley, what analysis has been done about the cost of raising the bedroom taxes against the amount of money that's been dispensed? Have you asked any of the local authorities, North Lanarkshire, for example, what would be involved in the cost of uh, you know, actually distributing the bedroom tax versus the amount of money they've received? No, I haven't. I, 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 I don't particularly understand your question. I'm sorry. Well, the, the rationale for this, there was a report uh, in the papers on Sunday that the cost of bedroom tax, cost of actually... Uh, chasing bedroom tax, you know, the cost of applying bedroom tax was actually a lot more than the money that was received by councils. Yes, yes, yes because as uh, they did go down the road, uh, the factions that cost more, but yeah, it's just, I was, I, 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 I think I, uh, that this money, this money covers just, just, just uh, the rent, so that's been the administration cost by housing associations and local authorities since then that, that would that is added to this but this money just covers the rent yeah, I think it's worthwhile asking that question because we all agree again albeit some lately but the, the, how iniquitous this tax is but it makes a nonsense of it if it actually is generating more costs than, than the monies that are available you're, you're, you're 100% right it's, it's, uh, it doesn't save money I think most people do that at the beginning uh, the government initially said it's it saves money, but it, it, it doesn't because it, yeah, it's not. It's just moving the, the responsibility from the central government to the local government and housing associations and tenants. They say that it improves the housing system, bleh, which it doesn't, doesn't neither. And the bedroom tax makes no sense. It, it, it makes no sense, and it costs a lot of money, and it costs a lot to our, to our communities. It's, it's hurting a lot of people, and and I know it's not. I do appreciate that it doesn't emanate from this parliament. It's the only place you can stop it is in Westminster. But coming here is a, is a plea for help for the, the, the tenants that aren't, that aren't got any protection at the moment. I'm, I'm very short of time, but I'd like to bring in John Wilson. Thank John you, Convener. Just to ask Mr Wiley, a couple of points that Ms Bailey referred to. And one point was about the £50 million from the Scottish Government. In an earlier answer, Mr Wiley, you indicated the shortfall. You agreed with me that the shortfall was really £13.3 million rather than uh, the £30 million that may be alluded to by Ms Bailey. Uh, and I wonder if you'd want to confirm that the overall cost uh, in relation to offsetting the bedroom tax would be £50 million, that £20 million has currently been set aside by the Scottish Government to assist local authorities, albeit that £20 million isn't ring-fenced, <coughs> which might be an issue that we can take up at a later date. But the £13.6 million that's been allocated by the DWP uh, to give discretionary housing payments to local authorities uh, does give us a, currently a working total of £37.6 million. And the short... Uh, 36 point, I'm getting my figures right here, but around about £36 million and the short, real shortfall was about thirteen million. That is a, as far as I was concerned, it was approximately thirty-five million in the system at the moment, and the, the shortfall was fifty-three. That was what was, uh, that was what was estimated at the. 
while we've run out of time, I, I, I got the impression that we could keep this going for another few hours. Um, but certainly, thank you very much for um, coming along. If you, if you just hold on for a couple of minutes, the next point is the committee goes into summation mode, which means that we then discuss which options are open to committee. Um, I still think it was important that we raised a whole series of questions and just merely refer this uh, uh, matter on to the Welfare Reform Committee. Uh, having said that, I, my, my view is that we should now refer this petition to the Welfare Reform Committee because they are actively considering this um, as we speak. Um, but nevertheless, I did find your contributions very helpful. And we had a variety of questions from members, but I think it was important that we had put these questions to you and we got some answers as well. Uh, can, it, can I ask the committee whether they agree with my recommendation that we refer this to Welfare Reform Committee? Great. Um, and could I thank you for coming uh, along, Mr. Wyler. Obviously, Welfare Reform Committee will keep you up to date with developments. Can I also thank Jackie Bailey for coming along. I know Jackie Bailey is taking a great interest in these matters and appreciate her comments um, to you as well. So thank you.